morning, everyone. Welcome to our final day of our May meeting here in Washington, D.C. Uh, let's get through things pretty quickly. We have a lot of people need to catch airplanes. Let's start off with the business section. Um, SSC reports. We do not have one for this meeting. Uh, Paul, is there anything you'd like to speak on? Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just just wanted to say, look forward to uh, supporting the work of the council during the coming year. Uh, we have had a couple of subgroup meetings, but uh, we have nothing to report uh, formally to the council. Thank you. Uh, I'll entertain any questions that people have on about a process and so forth. But thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Paul? Seeing none, thank you, Paul. Let's move into the executive director's report. Chris Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Getting organized here. He's zipping along. And we do have one other before we get to, uh, to this, the executive director's report. We do have the, the executive committee report. The executive committee met on Tuesday uh, to talk about the Rick C. Savage Award. They did select someone to receive that award. We'll announce that later. Uh, probably at the February meeting, we'll be talking, uh, or we'll be meeting in, in Durham. Um, the other thing that the executive committee decided to do was to solicit nominations for our other award. So we have an award of excellence. Uh, we haven't given that award out to anyone since 2016. So sometime over the next month or so, you'll see a request from me asking for nominations for that award. Uh, we'll have a, an executive committee meeting in uh, April to go over those nominations and then decide how to uh, proceed. So that's the executive committee report. And if look at that photo behind me, I see a lot of smiling faces. I think that uh, thanks to Mary and to you all, we had uh, we had a great photo. That's one of the better photos that we've taken as council. So. Thanks for everyone for participating in that. And thanks, Mary, for taking that particular photo. And that photo will appear on our website uh, shortly. Um, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll proceed through the rest of my report. Um, if you take a look at the material behind the tab uh, from me, you can see that the first item behind the Mr. agenda. Chair, Mr. Chair, can, we, can you go back to the photo for a second? <laughs> no. Please. <laughs> <laughs> can we say that that was in front of the Department of Commerce since you can't see Treasury up there? You, we, we could say it, anything we want. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh, yes, back to the work. So the first item behind the, uh, the tab is the meeting topics. So this is the first time that you've seen this document. Uh, folks that have been on the council for a while know that we start out the year basically planning our year. So uh, you decided on an implementation plan back in December for 2023. An implementation plan is then we basically take, take a look at everything that we need to do over the year and plan it out. So if you look at uh, where we're at uh, in February, you can see all the things that we did uh, this week. Our next meeting is going to be in Durham, scheduled for April 4th through 6th. Um, we haven't met at this particular hotel. Shelly's been down there, says it's an excellent location. So we're looking forward to getting down there. Uh, we have plenty to do at that particular meeting. So right now on our, our list are the things that you see in front of you there. It's likely that we'll add other things to the list as well. And I think you know that this is uh, a living document uh, that things change over, change over time. Uh, so we need to adapt. But again, this looks like uh, how things are gonna look for the, uh, for the rest of the year. We have, uh, as you can see, as you scroll through this, you can see that we have our typical meetings in, in August and December with uh, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Uh, good to see Bob here this morning. So we'll be meeting with them. You can see the, uh, the items that we'll be uh, talking about at those particular meetings. If you like, if, uh, you like charts and like looking at this a different way, you can take a look at uh, the next document behind the tab, which is uh, topics at a glance. That and then finally, on this particular to topic, there's a uh, meeting schedule that uh, I think you've seen before. This indicates uh, on one page where we're going to meet 
uh, for the year and, and um, the dates. So any questions about any of that before I proceed? Okay, seeing none. The next item on the tab is the 2023 proposed actions and deliverables. It's the document I referenced earlier. This is the document that you uh, approved. We had some changes. We had a good discussion in December and that reflects those particular comments and changes. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this document, but certainly you can take a look at it and see what we have planned for uh, 2023. Any questions about that document? Okay, seeing none. Uh, uh, the next item on the tab is a letter to Matt Picard, who's the regional director of NOAA's National Marine Sanctuaries. Um, and basically, this is the letter that uh, we talked about last meeting. It says, thank you for consulting with the Mid-Atlantic Council on the designation of the Hudson Canyon. This letter provides our determination on whether we deem it necessary to prepare, to prepare draft regulations for fishing within the EZ to implement the uh, the uh, sanctuary and the short answer is we don't so if you scroll through the letter it basically talks about uh, some of our concerns some of the things that we've done um, and the last couple paragraphs say the council's fishery management plan to create system-wide conservation benefits we conclude no additional fishing measures are needed to implement the proposed sanctuary as i understand it there's a similar letter from a similar letter from the new england council uh, the next item behind the tab is a letter to Mike from Mike uh, indicating his approval of Amendment 23 to the Squid Map for Butterfish Plan and uh, basically detailing what those, uh, what those specifications and uh, items are in that particular amendment. The next item behind the tab is a letter to uh, me from Tom indicating Tom Neese, who's the Executive Director of the New England Council, indicating that the New England Council did what we did relative to spiny dogfish. Any questions about any of that before I move on? The next uh, item behind the tab is a letter from Tom Neese to uh, Mike, John, Bob, and Chris, uh, requesting that uh, we do a management track assessment for White Hake. White Hake is important to uh, the New England Council um, basically, the letter requests a change in how we deal with that particular assessment. You can read the details of the letter in the letter if you're interested. Speaking of Tom Neese, next on behind the tab, that smiley guy there. It's Tom Neese for the folks that haven't met him. Uh, Tom is retiring. He's been with the, uh, the council, I think, for 20, how many years there? 25? Yeah, 25 years. He was with the uh, Coast Guard for 21 years before that. Um, he has uh, done a lot in his career. Uh, certainly, I think that the New England Council is going to miss him. I'm going to miss him. I enjoyed working with him over the years. He's going to be uh, serving as the executive director for about another six months. And if you noticed, I think a number of you got the email uh, the other day indicating that they've started the search process for the new executive director that is underway. Any questions, comments, Eric, about that? No, no comments from me, Chris. Yeah, I mean, we're going to miss Tom, but we're going to replace Tom, and we're going to move ahead. I mean, that, that's, you know. <laughs> I mean, business is business. Is business. I mean, you know, he, he's a tremendous resource, and he's got uh, an I'm, I'm sure Tom... uh, institutional knowledge, and it's going to be. But anyway, yeah, we've uh, plan is we're going to engage a search firm, which uh, we're actually soliciting uh, for a search firm to help us uh, find some find the appropriate winning candidate. So now I'm anticipating that his last day will be sometime in like August 1st in that time frame. So, okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none. Um, the next item behind the tab is a reminder. So we have talked about the harassment and discrimination training that's being provided by the National Marine Fishery Service. Uh, all council members are required to take that particular training unless they've had similar training through their state agency. Um, to date, I think we're at about the 50% mark 
So they are they are tracking this. They do let me know who, who in fact has taken this particular course. Uh, you have you know, a couple more weeks. You have until the end of February to do it. So it's an important thing for us. Uh, it's an important thing for the National Marine Fishery Service. And again, if you haven't taken the training, please do. The next uh, item behind the tab is our wind update. Uh, we ask for a wind energy development update uh, for every council meeting, and Julia puts together these uh, these one or two page memos, basically indicating what uh, what's happened since the last time she updated us. We uh, continue to write a flurry of letters. Uh, these are letters that have been submitted. There's a couple letters that are in progress. So again, a lot of things happening with wind, and I think that's no surprise to folks around the table. Uh, there have been some updates to offshore wind energy regulations. You can find those there. One of the big things that uh, that uh, the states in particular have been interested in is this next bullet there, which is the Regional Fund Administrator for, Comp for Compensatory Mitigation. And we had that update uh, regarding the RFI at our last meeting. The date closed the other day, so that's uh, that's done. I'm sure they're they're looking at the RFIs now. We had the uh, we had the wind and whale uh, discussion uh, the other day. There's some information there, some research funding information there as well. Construction uh, information in terms of what's happening with uh, South Fork Vineyard wind, and uh, some other uh, ways to stay informed. Any questions about that? Yeah, Joe. A couple things. Uh, I um, one was on the training. I finished it a while ago and was getting emails that I still needed to complete one. I think there was a little, you know, maybe there are some technical issues and saving um, progress. Uh, but I, I, I tried again this morning. And hopefully this time it'll it'll acknowledge that I finished it. Um, and second, on the uh, on the RFI, at the same time that many of us will be meeting here. Um, <clears throat> The ninth uh, next week for for the climate resilient uh, stuff, there will be uh, a meeting in New York of the nine states to go over the stuff. So they'll they're doing their best to move that along. So I do have a follow up question about that, which is what happens after that. So next week you guys meet, choose you know, what what happens. Yeah, potentially. I guess it depends on how clear of a path you know, the the suggestions are, and and what the nine states. I mean, that's that's a lot of governors' offices to get together on <laughs> concurrence. So, um, you know, I, I, that's part of the challenge. But I think we will we will see how clear of a path you know the the RFI uh, has laid out for us. So we're we'll, we'll trying to digest that as soon as possible. You any other comments, questions? Okay, the next item behind the tab is an actual action item for the council. This relates to SSC membership reappointments. Uh, this uh, memo from Brandon to uh, the council indicates that uh, basically the, why we're doing this. Uh, there are four members whose three year term expires in March. They're up for reappointment. All four of those members are listed below. Uh, they have indicated interest in uh, continuing to serve on the SSC. They include uh, Garrett Piper, Gavin Fay, Jorge Holzer, and Alexi Sheroff. Um, staff recommends that we reappoint those folks. Uh, typically, we've had questions about their membership, uh, or not their membership, their, uh, their participation uh, at the various meetings that uh, we have for the SSC. So you can look at that table to see that uh, most of them attend most of the meetings over the year, at least in the, you know, for the last uh, several years. So with that, I uh, just need an indication, uh, Mr. Chair, from um, the council as to whether or not they uh, concur that in fact that these folks should be reappointed. Peter Hughes. Thanks, Chris. And, and if you need a motion to that, But I do have a question also. 
Yeah, I think I think having a motion would be fine. We don't have to vote, but if everyone agrees, but certainly a motion on on the table would be good. And I'm glad to answer your question. Uh, my question is: is I believe we received a letter from uh, Doc, Dr. Anderson mm -hmm. the other day, who indicated that he'd be retiring from the SSC. I was just wondering how how does that void go about being filled? Do we put out a solicitation or something like that, or just my own curiosity? So exactly, we have uh, we go through a process like we did uh, the last time. We put out a solicitation. See who's interested. Um, I need to have some conversations with staff and with leadership about that particular slot. Lee is an economist. To, to think about whether or not we're actually going to be looking for another economist or you know, just anybody. Um, we had several folks that uh, applied the last time, so it would have been two years ago, maybe it's been three now, that uh, we thought were great, but just because we only had a certain number of slots, we couldn't. So I'm, I'm hoping that some of them reapply. But the solicitation process would basically take us through a timeline of, uh, I would guess, uh, through June. So maybe maybe April if um, possible, but uh, yeah, over the next several months we'll be uh, looking soliciting for another person. And uh, and Peter references, I think everyone saw it, uh, the email from Lee indicating stepping off the SSC because of health issues. Lee has been around for a long time. He's uh, been associated with this council for many 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 years. And, uh, what knows that so. So we're going to miss Lee. We certainly appreciate all the service, and um, hopefully we can find a good replacement for him. So with that, I would say that probably 30 years ago was the first council meeting I ever attended, and he was at the table. Long time, and he was sorely missed. But uh, with that, I would make a motion. If you make a motion to uh, reappoint to the SSC. Uh, Drs. Garrett the Piper, Dr. Gavin Fay, Dr. Jorge Holzer, it's Jorge, and Dr. Alexi Sherald. Do we have a second on the motion? I don't think we need any discussion on the motion. Uh, Obviously, they all show up because ninety-two percent. Three of them missed one meeting in three years. I think that's pretty good. So they obviously they want to do it. Uh, let's just see if we can pass this by consensus. Is there any objections? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks everyone. Uh, there's two more items uh, behind the tab. There's supplements. The first one is a plan that relates to sturgeon. So remember, as part of our implementation plan, we talked about uh, the sturgeon action plan to reduce sturgeon bycatch. Uh, we talked about where we've, we've had a lot of presentations on sturgeon. I think everyone understands the issue. This is a document that uh, Carson put together, uh, working with Robin from the New England Council staff, uh, basically taking us through um, the next couple of years. Um, and uh, she notes in this particular document, some of the details are still under development. There were some concerns, questions raised by the New England Council when they reviewed this document at their meeting a couple of weeks ago. Um, those have not been resolved yet, and uh, we'll be working with leadership to, uh, to basically do that. So if you can see, uh, you can see where we're at uh, through, uh, I said multiple years, it's multiple months, it's 2023. So you can take a look at how uh, things uh, are uh, going to happen over those particular months based on this plan, taking us through uh, a uh, action in December from both councils. So if you want, you can take a look at that table and that's uh, basically details some of the specifics. Any questions about this? I think everyone understands what we're trying to do with this. Questions, comments? Uh, Bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just a comment from ASMFC perspective. I think there's, depending on where the councils go, there's a good chance that ASMFC and the states need to make some changes in state water. So we'll be kind of tagging along and, uh, you know, at least.
be sitting in on some of those meetings and watching. And if there are complementary measures in state waters, we'll, we'll take those same actions to make sure the, you know, protection of sturgeon is kind of seamless throughout the range. Okay, any other questions, comments? Thank you. The last item behind the tab is a letter that uh, went out on February 1 to Mike from Mike. Uh, this is a letter that we thought a lot about and basically expresses our, yes, you could say disappointment, and maybe some aggravation with how things uh, went at our December meeting relative to the timing and rationale for GARPO's advice regarding the 2023 recreational management measures for summer planter scup and black sea bass. I'm not going to read uh, the letter to you. Uh, certainly, it's there for everyone uh, to read, um, but uh, basically details why we're disappointed. And I think the important part of the letter is the last um, paragraph or two where we say that we really want to work with GARPO um, closely with them and our monitoring committee and the Commission's Technical Committee to make sure that we don't have this situation again in 2023. Um, and um, certainly um, we are and we do reach out to, uh, to GARFO staff. We, we like working with them. We look forward to engaging with them on these discussions. And again, that's, that's the, the important thing. We just don't want to have, we don't want to be in the same situation in 2023 that we were in 2022, period. And with that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd be glad to answer any questions or comments. Any questions or comments for Chris? Not see any. They're off the hook. Thank you very much. Let's go to organizational reports. Uh, NOAA Fisheries, Greater Atlantic Regional Office, Mike Bentley. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I um, have a few things to go over. On um, January 24th, we approved Amendment 23 to the Mackerel Squid Butterfish FMP, uh, which was the rebuilding plan, the revised rebuilding plan for Atlantic mackerel and the 2023 mackerel specs. Um, we published the final rule last week on February 1st, and um, the rebuilding plan prevents overfishing and is plan expected to rebuild the stock by 2032. The uh, ABC for 2023 is 8,094 metric tons with a commercial quota of 3639 metric tons, retaining the 129 metric ton river herring and shad catch cap. Uh, and then, as I think everybody around the table knows, but just as a reminder, uh, brand new in this amendment is now a recreational possession limit of 20 fish per person. Uh, on December 21st, we published the final adjusted catch specs for the 2023 bluefish fishery. Uh, consistent with the council's recommendations. Uh, the specifications at the higher level are unchanged from those projected in prior multi-year actions, uh, but there was a reduction of 8 million pounds from the recreational harvest limit to account for a recreational overage in 2021, uh, as well as updating recreational discard data. So we have a revised uh, RHL of 14.11 million pounds which is actually an increase of 1.6% from the 2022 RHL. And the commercial quota increased 21% um, as projected to 4.29 million pounds. And that was effective January 1st um, for the start of the fishing year. We published the final rule for the 2023 summer flounder scup and black sea bass specs on January 3rd, although it was effective on January 1st because of when it filed with the Federal Register. Um, so this action sets all of the ABCs, recreational and commercial uh, catch limits, catch targets, commercial quotas, RHLs, all that good stuff. Um, and those are all consistent with the new uh, allocations that were adopted by the council and the commission in Amendment 22. Uh, moving up the coast a little bit to the New England uh, Council's actions, we uh, published the fishing year 2022 adjustments to on January 17th to, for the uh, Northeast Multi-Species Sector Program. And so that's where we, each year, we uh, announce any sector allocations that are carried over from a prior fishing year. Um, no surprises there. Uh, also of interest to this council and New England Council, on February 6th, we published the final rule adding the Omega Net Mesh Measurement Gauge 
uh, as a permissible device for trawl net mesh size measurement, and uh, we made some minor regulatory corrections. So we've been consulting with the councils on this uh, over a period of several years uh, with this new uh, Omega uh, gauge that uh, the Coast Guard and others can use now uh, as a more efficient device uh, for, for measuring trawl net mesh size. On January 13th, we filed a temporary rule in the FR closing the closed area one scallop access area for the remainder of the 2023 fishing year to limited access general category vessels. That was effective January 14th. Um, and that's an action that's required when we project that 100% uh, of the LHC allocated trips are allocated uh, to the area where uh, have been taken. Uh, and that temporary rule expires at the end of the fishing year on March 31st. Um, on Atlantic Herring, um, we published a, uh, or on January 1st, the Herring fishery began operating under the default 2023 specs that had been previously approved and implemented through Framework Adjustment 8 to the FMP, uh, which established the 2021 through 2023 specs. The Council had recommended, New England Council had recommended revised 2023 specs back in September, um, and we're, those are currently under review. Once those publish, they will replace the default 2023 specs. Um, which will increase the some of the, the quotas um, and uh, the from the remainder of the fishing year, then they will operate under the the uh, the new the new quotas new specs. Um, and that's important because we took two actions in January um, to reduce the possession limit down to two thousand pounds in herring management areas one uh, B and area three, um, based on uh, hitting the thresholds under the old specs. Once we publish the new specs, we'll reset those quotas uh, and we expect those two areas to reopen um, under the new higher uh, allocations. Um, not really relevant to uh, most people that fish in the mid-Atlantic, but certainly uh, getting some news. On January 31st, uh, we announced an emergency rule for trap pot fisheries off the coast of Massachusetts, uh, where we closed what we call the Massachusetts Restricted Area Wedge. Um, and that was closed from February 1st through April 30th uh, under an Endangered Species Act emergency rule. If you recall, back in uh, January, we sent a letter regarding the monkfish research set aside program. Um, I know we've been back and forth on this a few times. Initially, we did not intend to solicit research set aside proposals for monkfish in this year due to uh, poor funding outlook, um, but we did get some indications from both researchers and uh, fish, fishing industry members, that there was interest in pursuing a research set aside program for monkfish this year. Uh, so we did publish, um, or we are publishing a notice um, and we'll have an abbreviated solicitation period uh, in order to try to make up some time and get those awards out as soon as we can. So that's all I have, unless there's any questions. Any questions or comments for Mike? Julie, I wanted to ask you about the implement <clears throat> about the approval uh, of the blue line tilefish uh, reporting, where the council sent in reporting to man make mandatory reporting before the fish came off the vessel, or the vessel left the water, is the way it was sent in from the council, I believe, and. Uh, Garfo came back and implement, and it was implemented a 24 hour grace period of reporting time. And what that has done is basically took any chance of enforcement. At the dock, uh, and we're seeing that result in the, uh. People not reporting or the opportunity to, and I'm wondering. Uh, what was the reason for that switch between the council or clarify it for me if I'm wrong, the switch between what the council sent in, what y'all approved, and could it be looked at in the future coming from the council in a different amendment or framework or something like that to change that? Because basically it's neutered. Well, that might not be the word, but it, it, it's, it's, uh, took the enforcement part out of it, which I see is a big carrot to make people report. And that's why some of it is what we're seeing at the dock because folks just don't have to worry about it. They can do it 24 hours later. And and so I'm wondering 
the short uh, about why that took place or uh, a summary. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have any details um, right now. I mean, commercial and charter and, and, and charter party permit holders have 48 hours to submit. Private recreational tilefish um, permit holders have 24 hours. I'm not sure I understand why we should have gone to zero for for the for the private rec um, anglers when effectively everybody else has 48 hours. Well, I, um, I mean, how, I don't see a reason why. I mean, is it not? Wouldn't that? A more stricter, you can't have it. Uh, a more stricter regulation to 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 uphold or to make reporting. Like Virginia has a, a process for their winter sea bass, black sea bass, where they have to report uh, when they leave the dock, and they have to report when they come back. I know that that's a state uh, mandate to you know to protect them for the reporting, but uh, I'm just curious about how, how do we get compliance up more. Given that you really don't, you know, God could come down to the dock and somebody say, well, hey, I ain't got a report for 24 hours. Uh, I'm just trying to look at how to get the enforcement up uh, or com uh, com let me say it, compliance up, uh, rate up besides the dismal amount that it is now. And, and so any help or thought in that process by GARFO uh, would be much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's a couple of issues. One is, the, the reporting is required electronically, but we don't require people to have the capability on the vessel to report immediately. So, you know, 24 hours was just like the 48 hour um, we provide commercial and, and the for hire sector, 24 hours was intended to allow people to have the opportunity to go home and log into their computer and submit their reports if that's the only way that they have to do that. Um, I, I know we talk about compliance and there's certainly concern about compliance or enforcement, but the challenges with, with any type of private recreational angling, we just don't know who's actually fishing. So there's no way to confirm that. Um, we, I know, you know, we were provided a report showing, you know, very, few numbers of reports, but the challenge is matching that against actual trips, which is sort of unknown. Um, we've been working, you know, council staff, regional office staff, we've been working on this issue for a long time, trying to figure out ways that we can improve um, awareness of the reporting requirements and hopefully start to get, you know, if, if there is poor compliance out there, we'll have to start to in improve that. Uh, I'm not sure that increasing or decreasing the submission time uh, is necessarily where we're going to achieve that. Okay, well, I'll, I'll work on this further because it, it has been worked on a long time. And, and I do think there's an opportunity through social media to reach out with some compliance assistance. It might be a targeted type thing that's going to take a little bit of time for enforcement. But I think a little bit of compliance assisting out in the public outreach um, realm of it will get some attention because it's obviously, uh, you know, since we've implemented this, we've had 900 and some uh, uh, permits issued and, and um, I don't know what the amount is of catch. I, I know the catch on social media is a lot bigger and that the docks bigger than, than, than we're seeing. And so we'll have, we basically, know our universe, but we have nobody reporting. Just trying to look at how to how to kind of tie this uh, blue line tilefish issue up a little bit better. So finally, maybe we could get some data out of it one day. Uh, might not be in our lifetime, but at least somebody else can. So thank you. Scott Lennox. Lost you, Scott. Jason didn't. Can you hear me now? 
Yeah, Scott, go ahead. There we go. Good morning. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I agree 100% with what Dewey's saying, um, except for the fact that I, I don't I don't necessarily agree with uh, lowering that reporting requirement time to 24 hours, but um, compliance is way, way down. We're trying to make an effort in Ocean City to, to do it. I do it through my social media. We've done a couple of our TV shows where we're targeting blue line or golden tiles, and I've mentioned several times how the, there is a reporting requirement, not just a recommendation. Um, I think it's going to come down to some sort of either threat of a penalty or a penalty if you don't report before people really get on board with it, which is unfortunate. But I think we do need to try and do a better job of getting the word out there that it's a requirement uh, to report these tilefish. Thanks. Jason didn't. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah, I just followed following up on what Dewey said, the, the, the amendment is originally passed had the um, language that the fish would have to be reported before um, the fish left the boat or the boat left the water to kind of provide a, an unambiguous um, enforcement opportunity, um, any fish on the dock or on a trailered boat. Um, you know, would already have to have been reported. And as Mike said, because of um, you know, there was a long, there was a some delay in implementation, and then those different concerns. Um, you know, the, the that Mike kind of went through. The end result was the 24 hours. So uh, just um, you know, a little bit of so you know, it may have addressed some things, but then this kind of unambiguous enforcement kind of opportunity was is not there now because of that 24 hours so there's definitely trade-offs there um you know as things been discussed we have plans for additional outreach but uh anyway just a little more background on how um you know why that was put in there originally and then um mike said the different concerns of why that wasn't um why the implementation was a little different Caleb Gilbert. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound fine. Uh, good. I, I just thought I'd chime in on the conversation. Um, uh, thanks, Scott and Dewey, for uh, raising this point again. I think um, one or both of you have, have raised it in the past. I, I can't speak to any ongoing investigations, but um, I, I can say that this, this we're, we're, we're aware of the, the issue and we, 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 aren't, we will um, use any and all resources available at our disposal to uh, enforce regulations. So that's kind of from the law enforcement side, all I can speak to on, on that topic. But I, I will forward uh, along to leadership again that, that, that this came up at today's meeting. Thank you, Caleb. Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question about the timing for the herring review 2023 specs. Do you have any idea what that might look like? I'm hoping we see it very soon. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> any more questions or comments around the table? Jason, you raised your hand again or put it down or? Yeah, uh, I'll just flag um, that. I think both based on the quarter monitoring website, both the, um, the river herring shad cap ratios for um, the mackerel fishery and um, at least some components of the Atlantic herrings cap are, are, are pretty high right now. Um, and uh, um, so, if for for folks who are involved in those fisheries, definitely if they can um, try to avoid those river herring and shad. If we get some observed trips, we'll bring that ratio down. But as things stand now, it's um, you know quite possible that the caps um, will close the fisheries at least in again for mackerel in some of the herring areas before um, the the actual quotas of those species um, close the the fisheries.
All right, thank you, Jason. Any more questions, comments around the table? Anyone from the audience? Anyone online? I do not see any more hands up. Thank you, Mike. Let's go to NOAA Fisheries Northeast Fishery Science Center. John Hare. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. A um, couple things to report. Um, I think as everybody knows, the FY23 federal budget passed, um, and we are awaiting our allocation. So to try to put that into plain plain language is uh, there is a budget, but we don't have money yet. Um, so there were increases for wind, uh, right whale surveys, uh, climate science, and then also uh, what we call adjustments to base. So we, we are thinking that we're going to be in a pretty good position this year. Um, with the increase for surveys, um, we are expecting to be able to fully fund the VIMS and Maine New Hampshire NEMAP surveys this year. Um, those increases are not permanent. Um, so we'll be back in sort of the uncertainty uh, grounds as we go as we enter FY24. Um, we did put out uh, a year end summary of all of our survey activities, and I'll share that link with the executive director so we can distribute it to you. Um, we are expecting to be able to do our full suite of surveys in FY23, um, with the exception of our coastal shark bottom longline survey. Um, an issue arose with the vessel. Um, and vessel captains and crews. So we're going to uh, not do that survey in 23 and hope to be able to do that in 24. Um, also, uh, it's some of the work that we've been doing around the wind survey mitigation. Uh, we've been working with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute to move HABCAM, which is a towed vehicle, onto one of their larger AUVs. Um, and we hope to be doing trials with that this summer. And so that would, you know, take it off a ship platform and put it onto an autonomous platform. Uh, Northeast Trawl Advisory Panel, you heard about the update yesterday. We continue to, to engage with that group um, and are you know, very supportive of the activities of that group is leading. Uh, observer updates, um, the observer program is on track to, to meet most of its past sea days in the NEFOP program. Uh, we've been working with the United States Coast Guard uh, they've been participating in the observer training sessions uh, just to help emphasize the importance of safety at sea and the interaction between Coast Guard and the observer program. Um, Nicole Cabana and I, Deputy Director of the Northeast Fishery Science Center, um, continue to meet with every training class uh, to uh, just talk with them about the importance of, of observer data and the importance of working in partnership um, with ship captains and crews to collect that data. Um, and last week was the first time that we had been able to meet with those classes in person. Uh, the classes have been in person, but Nicole and I were participating remotely. Um, but we were able to meet in person and we will continue to do that. Um, can you do that? Well, I guess, you know, Eric, I hope, hope we can continue to do that and, you know, not taken away from that being able to do that. So keep going. Um, let's see safety. We do stress safety during those briefings uh, just to let them know that you know, safety at sea is critical. And that's why we really appreciate having the Coast Guard. Um, in terms of the assessment updates, uh, Russ Brown gave the, the report on the dogfish and bluefish assessment. Um, you know, again, we, we have had challenges with our 2023 assessment schedule. We talked about that at last meeting. Uh, we've approved two new hires into our population dynamics group. Uh, looking at our budget, uh, hopefully that will be four. So we'll need to see our numbers. Um, but by sort of increasing the capacity of that group, uh, we hope that goes a long way in terms of us being able to meet assessment schedule for 2023. Um, you know, we have received you know the request from the New England Fisheries Management Council to do another white hake assessment. Um, and so that's adding an assessment to the assessment schedule. Um, and the NRCC uh, stock assessment oversight group is looking at that request um, and will be making a sort of a recommendation uh, to the NRCC principal soon, I hope. Um, we've also 
officially form the research track steering committee. Um, that committee will start setting research plans for research tracks. Uh, so when we do do a research track, the idea is that we would have, you know, new research to bring to the table. Um, we've been, you know, with, with dogfish, you heard, we were able to get some dogfish aging into the assessment, but it was a little rushed. Um, and so the idea is to continue to try to get ahead of the research that is needed to really make progress on these stock assessments. Um, in terms of catch data, we did have the catch accounting and monitoring system peer review uh, January 17th to 19th, um, and we're waiting for the official peer review reports. Went well, um, and the system will be very functional, and it will uh, have one catch data system for the region, um, which is something that we've been sort of at the NRCC in particular working to get to this point for quite some time, quite some time being years. Um, so, you know, th a lot of credit to the staff at GARFO and the Science Center for, for seeing that project through. Um, you know, in terms of council staff um, or council, you know, just the, the executive director, you know, if there's questions or our staff want to work with the system, you know, ask, you know, you can reach out to Dave Bouvet and Mike Simpkins and they can work just to make sure that there's an understanding from that perspective. Cooperative Research Summits, um, they hosted our Cooperative Research Group, hosted a summit in Virginia, January 31st. It was very well attended. Um, over 250 scientists, industry members, and uh, managers participated. And then there will be another summit next week in uh, Providence. So sort of a mid-Atlantic focused and a New England focused summit. Um, and we are planning to recruit five new vessels into our study fleet program in 2023. Um, protected species, we heard a lot about right whales yesterday. Um, we did have, and I think Michelle raised this, there was a, a peer review of our decision support tool to support the take reduction team, um, uh, January 30 to Feb 1. That review went well. Um, I was going to be looking at sort of, as I said yesterday, sort of what are the short term uh, things that need to be done now, and then what are some long term developmental things that can be done over time. Um, but we are waiting for the written response from the review. We expect that by end of February. Um, uh, Henry Milliken, Eric Matson, and Brian Galvez gave a presentation at the New England Council two weeks ago um, on sort of the development of on demand fishing and sort of recognizing gear that's not marked at the surface on the bottom. Um, I think it could be useful. Uh, if at a future date that they could give a similar presentation here. I think that is going to be a challenge uh, regionally um, as our pot and trap fisheries, you know, if when they move to an on-demand system without surface, surface marking. Um, offshore wind, we've been working hard in that arena. Um, we finished the survey mitigation plan and are starting to implement that. We're going through each one of our surveys that's going to be impacted. Um, there are 14 surveys that the Northeast Fisheries Science Center conducts that are going to be impacted by offshore wind energy development. Um, so we're working now with just the principles of those surveys to start sort of laying out a plan to you know, conduct, collect the data that needs to be collected in a world where there are offshore wind turbines um, throughout the Northeast. Um, and we will be working collaboratively with the councils, with NRCC, with others, as we continue this planning effort and start uh, you know, taking our first steps in terms of survey mitigation. The HABCAM porting over to an autonomous vehicle is a, is a first step for the scallop survey. Um, and we anticipate taking full advantage of advanced technologies as we move forward. Um, and I think the last thing that I will say is that we continue to produce our monthly science highlights. Um, so anyone would like to, if you don't get them and would like to, I can share the information. It's delivered something through gov, you know, delivery.gov and you subscribe um, and you'll automatically get them. And you can also subscribe to a number of other uh, NOAA, I'm not sure they're not publications per se, but NOAA email um, category. So with that, Mr. Chair, I will stop and take questions. Thank you, John. Any questions or comments? Chris Moore? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. John, I didn't get a chance to talk to my staff about the uh, summit, the Cooperative Research Summit. So I'm curious as to um, what happened. So, yeah, a lot of folks, 
Uh, sounded like there was good discussion. So what happens with all that? Is there, is there, was it, was the summit basically identifying research topics, research needs? Just curious. Thanks. Yeah, I don't have a full report out, so I, I should have. Um, but I think it was more sort of research needs and research opportunities um, and you know, help advise the program what topics they should be thinking of addressing in the future, but also trying to have the region, everyone in the region think cooperatively um, and seeing cooperative research as a way to work together to answer questions that we have. So it's not only a Northeast Fishery Science Center cooperative research program, it becomes a uh, you know, in the region, we use cooperative research as a way to answer our questions. But I can get a, uh, there will be detailed reports coming out of those. I think they're probably going to wait until after that February 1 to finalize those reports. Dewey? Yeah, I attended uh, the cooperative research summit in Newport News, and I thought it was very well done, uh, educational. Uh, you had a lot of different folks there from different uh, avenues, uh, especially the commercial industry and academia and, and people that have done projects. And um, so I thought it was it was good. Um, it it uh, networked a lot of folks. Uh, folks got to talk. So I, I, I thought it was good. I attended it for uh, about six hours. And uh, think in the future, there's futility and more things like that type of things of bringing folks together from the northeast and and different things you know i saw folks from the southeast and and, and um and in management so i think it's it was a good thing and i thought it was well done uh timely reports people giving uh some of their uh, presentations on the work they've done folks asking questions from the audience and so i thought it was good and and I think it could be more stuff like that in the future, maybe a couple times a year at different locations to get people networking. Because you got to put the folks together, and it gives a chance for industry, um, if they want to work with somebody or do something to attend, to maybe find somebody or, or a project or something that needs to be done or fill a gap or void. So I would recommend it, and I thought it was good and well done. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Thank you, John. No Office of General Counsel. Don Almeida. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, since our December meeting, uh, we have a couple of new lawsuits filed. Uh, first one of interest to the council uh, was Lofstad v. Raimondo, and that's a case where two commercial fishermen filed a lawsuit in the District of New Jersey challenging this council's commercial recreational allocation amendment to the Summer Flounder Scott Black Sea Bass FMP. That's Amendment 22 um, that uh, NIMS had just issued the final rule on. Um, this is an interesting case um, in that the plaintiffs are solely raising constitutional arguments. There aren't, um, you know, our typical cases in, when there's a challenge to a, an amendment will raise Magnuson, you know, national standards type arguments. This one is a solely constitutional argument about the Constitution's appointment clause. Um, it's in the early stages of uh, litigation. So our first step in the case is to answer the complaint and the answer is due uh, on February 27th of uh, this year. Um, the other new case that was filed is a right whale case, um, another in the series of right whale cases that we've been litigating. Um, this one was brought by the Massachusetts Lobstermen's Association in the District of Columbia. And uh, it was just filed last week. And this lawsuit is about the emergency rule that um, Marissa talked about the other day in the right whale update um, that would close a wedge area between um, within the Massachusetts restricted area. Um, there was an area that was inadvertently not closed and this um, emergency rule 
closes that uh, section um, for from February to mid May of this year, uh, or I think the beginning of May, I think April 30th, something like that. So um, the plaintiffs filed a motion, they filed a complaint and they filed a motion seeking, uh, you know, emergency injunctive relief to stop the closure from occurring. So that means this case is accelerated. Um, NIMS is filing an opposition to that motion today and the court has scheduled a hearing um, for a week from today. And that case has been assigned to Judge Boesberg, who, whose name you may recognize because he's been um, in the District of Columbia, the judge who's been working on these uh, other cases, these other right whale cases. Um, so he, he has this one now. Um, uh, so that was the Massachusetts Lobstermen's Association. The other case brought by industry in the District of Columbia was brought by the Maine Lobstermen's Association. And you may recall that that was a challenge to the 2021 biological opinion and the 2021 rulemaking. Um, and Judge Boesberg worked, uh, ruled in NIMS's favor in the district court in that case. Um, the Maine Lobstermen's Association filed an appeal to the DC Circuit um, in like middle of September. Um, and they sought an expedited briefing schedule. And so that case is, that appeal has been moving pretty quickly. Um, the, after the appeal, so basically it was briefed this fall and the court has set up oral argument on the appeal for uh, later this month, February 24th. After the appeal was fully briefed, um, you know, the, uh, the measures in the Consolidated Appropriations Act that were discussed in Marissa's update and how they affect the um, regulation of right whales going, uh, regulation of the lobster and Jonah crab industry going forward. Uh, in light of that legislation, NIMS filed a motion to dismiss the appeal and um, the party, the other parties have not yet filed their responses to that motion to dismiss. Um, but I think that the expectation is that that motion to dismiss will be at least discussed at the oral argument on the underlying appeal. Um, so a lot going on in that uh, MLA case, Maine Lobster, uh, Lobsterman's Association case. In the other case before Judge Boesberg, the Conservation Law Foundation Center for Biological Diversity case, um, you may recall that Judge Boesberg um, issued a remedy order uh, in November of 2022 that set up a schedule for the next rulemaking that NIMS was, would be doing um, relating to uh, right whale um, interactions with fixed gear fisheries. And again, with the Consolidated Pro Appropriations Act, that kind of changed the landscape as far as the remedy, the schedule that Judge Boesberg had set up. Um, and NIMS filed a notice with the court as to the existence of this new legislation and indicated that the part, you know, the parties would confer to just, you know, try and get their hands around the implications of that legislation uh, in the litigate and it, on the litigation. And those discussions are ongoing. I expect there'll be more filings before Judge Boesberg in the not too distant future on this on these issues. Um, that's all I have for now. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Sonny Quinn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just um, a curiosity question. You know, with all your reports that you've been doing about the um, the going to court on these whale issues, has there ever been any court issues going on about ship strikes? Um, you know, environmentalists coming in, suing for the ships and the uh, boat strikes? Yeah, I haven't worked on the ship strike case, but there was a case 
a couple of years going back where environmentalists were seeking to, um, they filed a petition for rulemaking with, with NIMFS to you know, come up with new regulations on, like the existing rule, like, you know, and NIMFS um, started the new rulemaking process. And I believe that case was dismissed in light of the fact that there is a rulemaking process going forward. So there was at least that one case that I'm aware of where environmentalists were trying to force NIMPS to develop more regulations regarding ship strikes. Thank you. Chris Moore. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, last night I became aware of another, well, I have two questions to ask. It's okay, Mr. Chair. The first one is in regard to a lawsuit from or against Vineyard Wind. Participants in the lawsuit include Seabreeze and others, so I'd like to hear more about that. Um, yeah, I, I'm not working on the wind cases. There's several cases ongoing, um, but I asked um, some of my colleagues who are working on those cases for just a quickie summary on, on the sea freeze litigation specifically. Um, and my understanding is that Sea Freeze is challenging Bohm's approval of the construction operation plan for the Vineyard Wind project, and the legal uh, claims are based on the. Um, off, let me make sure I get this right. Offshore Coastal Lands Act, um, NEPA, ESA, and Clean Water Act, um, and in that case, they're looking to get the construction operation plan and the environmental impact statement and the record of decision vacated. And they're also looking for injunctive relief that would prevent you know, any construction activities from going forward. And it looks like um, that case should be fully briefed before the district court um, in March of this year. Thank you. And if I could, Mr. Chair, the, uh, there's Another conversation that I was involved in last night that confused me. There was, it was probably because of my confusion more than anything else. So you referenced a lawsuit. Your first reference was to a lawsuit out of Texas that had to do with the commercial recreational allocation. Not Texas. Yeah. This case is filed in the District of New Jersey. Yeah. Gotcha. So that has nothing to do with the harvest control rule, though. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, the, the harvest control rule hasn't been finalized yet. Um, this one is at this point. It's just about Amendment Twenty Two, the commercial recreational allocation amendment. Any more questions or comments for John? Anything else, John? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you very much. Let's go to no Office of Law Enforcement, Caleb Gilbert. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Council members. Um, related to our continued enforcement priorities within the Northeast Division, there's some right whale and observer priority related highlights I'd like to share this morning. Starting on right whales and Atlanta large whale take reduction plan compliance, I'm pleased to report our um, take reduction patrol figures from the first quarter FY23. OLE and our enforcement partners combined to inspect a total of about 380 individual lobster vessels across 52 take reduction plan focused patrols in the first quarter. The vast majority of those patrols were conducted by Maine Marine Patrol and creating a trend of incre increased compliance rate of um, take reduction plan compliance over the last three quarters, about 88% of those vessels, roughly 334 out of the 380 vessels inspected in the first quarter had no Altwerp violations identified when either or both the vessel or a trawl or multiple trawls were inspected. For reference, we saw about a 79% compliance rate in the fourth quarter FOI 22 among lobster vessels inspected. Um, in, inspected for uh, take reduction plan compliance then, and that was a tick up from what we saw in the third quarter, FY22, about 73%. Uh, we tabulated first quarter FY23 take reduction pl 
plan patrol direct data and figures two and three on pages eight and nine of the, the written report now up on the um, council's website. Thank you, Mary. Um, we, we tabulated these figures in the same manner as we did in our third and fourth quarter FY22 reports, written reports provided to the council. Uh, next, following the uh, ROV ops conducted in the fourth quarter FY22, um, enforcement officers conducted investigative res uh, work with results documented on page seven of the written report. Um, for those who don't recall, those ops were uh, conducted in lobster management area three, targeting lobster gear there. This year was the third year um, NED Northeast Division law enforcement staff engaged in an operation of this nature, um, ROV and LMA3, and we will continue this initiative through FY23. Uh, moving on to right whale speed enforcement, um, we've assessed over $200,000 in penalties across 25 cases for violations during the 21-22 season um, calendar year, uh, 23 of which have now settled. We documented our uh, specific first quarter FY23 speed enforcement efforts in our written report starting on page 6. I think I mentioned this at the last meeting, but it's worth repeating that our speed enforcement continues to involve all available technologies at our disposal including AIS and various radar devices. Our investigative support team staff continue to aid our agents and officers on the land and at sea speed operations patrols that are now underway for the 22-23 seasonal management area season. These are the um, SMAs we're all, I, I, I realize you, you guys probably already all know this, but these are the SMAs where all vessels 65 feet or longer must, must travel at 10 knots or less as part of the right whale speed rule. Um, for suspected speed violations, our agents and officers conduct the investigations and our investigative support team staff aid them with research and case documentation, such as by compiling GIS charts, investigative reports, and general vessel data. Our M2 mobile radar unit I've mentioned before is now operational, operational and continue to be deployed in coming um, SMA operations over the winter. It was up and running in December covering shipping and vessel traffic along Chesapeake Bay and has since been deployed in other locations such as along Delaware Bay for, for a speed operation there in January. As reported at the December Council meeting, our first speed rule off of the year concluded in the beginning of December. Um, in, our, in response to our efforts on that operation, we were invited to the U.S. Coast Guard Sector New York Harbor Operations Planning and Safety Steering Committee meeting. I know that's uh, a lot of words, but um, held at the following week in Staten Island to discuss with the group in attendance our right whale speed enforcement efforts. I think we were well received at the meeting, and I think um, New York Harbor shipping pilot boat interests were, were uh, interests were particularly interested in hearing from us since that was our first speed op ever conducted in the New York shipping channel. Our second speed op of the year off of Delaware Bay concluded three weeks ago, as I just mentioned, where we deployed our M2 unit and our D2 um, uh, senior enforcement officer and another enforcement officer also conducted a joint all uh, you know, take reduction plan and SMA patrol in Chesapeake Bay on Monday last week. Uh, no violations were documented in either the op or the patrol. Moving on to our observer priority work in the first quarter FY23, OLE continues our collaboration with the observer programs, fisheries, monitoring operations, branch staff, industry members, and observers as documented in the written report starting on page 11. The first highlight I'd like to report is two um, special agents uh, presented at two Northeast Fisheries Industry training workshops on harassment and sexual, uh, uh, sexual assault, sexual harassment in December. Um, this effort continued into January with three events held with industry, the last one on Friday, January 19th. The workshops held in December focused on members of the ground fishery, whereas the workshops um, the Northeast Fisheries Science Center's FMO branch and OLE conducted last month jointly were open to all fisheries. We saw better participation in January than we saw in December, as you might expect opening up the invitation more broadly, but I think we all would have liked to have seen more participation. We're, we're brainstorming ideas to increase participation at future events if we hold them, and we'd be open to any feedback folks are willing to provide to help encourage future participation by industry. Um, in addition, a uh, special agent participated in two observer training events for new observers in the first quarter FY23. That special agent now participates in two separate training agenda items at each observer training event for new observers. 
first agenda item is a general presentation on OLE geared towards helping new observers understand how OLE, OLE supports them. And the other agenda item is a more recent addition. That's an observer support panel that the SA participates in alongside U.S. Coast Guard and FMO staff. Both agenda items offer an opportunity for new observers to ask questions of OLE and FMO staff on enforcement related issues and concerns and allow for productive conversations. A general point I'd like to mention is that uh, through our general uh, observer program priority driven communications with FMO, we've noticed a trend in recent months of fewer outreach compliance assistance requests from FMO to reach out to specific owners and operators. We believe that's an indicator we're making progress in our work on this priority as a result of our cumulative efforts. As I've mentioned before, there is no new observer related law associated with this priority and the goal of this goals of this priority continue to be to reduce the overall number of observer related incidents and, and help encourage observer retention. And that's all I have uh, pre prepared today, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you. Do we have any questions for Caleb? Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Caleb, for the report. I was curious um, with respect to the um, vessel speed zone work that you all have been doing, if you're able to share any information about, uh, I guess, maybe the, the, the nature of the vessels that you're finding the speed violations. So, in other words, are they, you know, primarily from the shipping industry or, you know, can you share anything, any broad details like that? Yeah, um, I think it's pretty safe that I can say that the majority of what we've seen has been um, um, among private vessels. I, I don't have a breakdown for you, but I, I, I know that has been the, you know, I don't know, you want to call it a blind spot, but that's, that's just the, you know, I think the majority of the violations that we've, uh, lead violations that we've seen have been among um, um, privately owned vessels. Thank you. Sort of, as, I think I got as close as I can get. I would have expected to hear there'd be more like great companies or something like that. So thanks for that. Yeah, no problem. I think that those you know, that type of thing has happened, um, and I, and I, I might have listed a couple of examples, uh, specific examples in the written report. I, I tried to. Itemize as much information as, able, as, as, as I was able to find. So you might, you might. Uh, I think there was a, there, there might be an example or two of along the lines of what you're uh, looking for. Great. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My my question is basically what Michelle asks. I, I want to know how many vessels are operating under a foreign flag. Hmm. Um. There may be a case that I can share publicly. Um, I'd have to check on that, Eric. Any more questions? Uh, I do see one comment. Thank you. Um, I know all of you, I've come and gone in different positions representing the mid. Um, Caleb Gilbert is my husband, and we are about to celebrate our 12th anniversary. Um, and I just want to thank you, Caleb, for keeping the home front strong uh, while I'm here. I know that all of us, um, whether you're you know, sitting at the table or, or sitting in the audience, have sacrifices to make uh, when you sit here and represent all the jobs that you do. So I just want to give a shout out to him and by doing that, a shout out to all of you and your partners, dogs, children, everything else. Um, and I just want to say thank you, Caleb, for letting me stay here for two nights while I enjoy my time with the Mid-Atlantic and also know how much you're taking on at home. Um, it's a public meeting. I know that, but I know that that might represent a lot for a lot of people. So anyway, thank you for the opportunity to say that. Uh, thank you, dear wife. Looking forward to having you all. You only have a few days left to shop, so you may want to sneak out this afternoon and get what you need. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take your advice, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> Let's go to the audience. James Fletcher.
James, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. I see your microphone every once in a while comes off and on. All right, I see you took your hand down now. Any more questions or comments? Mr. Fletcher would like to email me with a, a question. I'm, I'm happy to receive it in that manner. All right, James, did you hear that? If you want to send uh, Caleb an email, he'll answer it that way. All right, let's go on now to the U.S. Coast Guard. Lieutenant Commander Caleb Gilbert. Oh, that's all right. Hey, good morning, then. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Same double duty. Uh, yeah, from the Coast Guard, uh, the past uh, uh, two months um, since our last report in December, uh, we've conducted 92 uh, fishery boardings. Um, so a little less than what we did uh, last year this time. Uh, we've had fewer uh, boardings on Atlantic striped bass and sea scallops. One of the things in the sea scallops we've noticed since the Mid-Atlantic Axis area has opened it, uh, the majority of the fleet has moved further north and outside of our boundaries. So uh, we haven't had the, the presence in the sea scallop um, vessels that we've had previously, which kind of drove down a little bit of our numbers. Um, we've also had um, uh, there's been a migrant surge off of Florida that's been in the news lately. We've been sending some of our resources down there, so that's impacted um, the resources that we have available for fisheries enforcement. Um, but during that time, we haven't had any violations uh, reported um, on the, uh, the the protected species uh, support. Uh, recently, at the end of India, end of January, uh, Richard Snyder, uh, home port in North Carolina, they worked with uh, a couple of the aquariums in North Carolina there, along with. Uh, Wildlife and Resources Commission to safely return about 100 turtles in the Gulf Stream. We've had a couple of operations going on um, over the past uh, a few months. Uh, Operation Stars and Stripers, um, which is one we target for um, Atlantic striped bass. Um, they've kind of since moved a little further south, um, but that's been ongoing. Uh, the right whale uh, speed enforcement, uh, we've also, similar to, to NOAA there, um, Caleb is reporting, we've been focusing on uh, hail informs and uh, some of the pulse ops that uh no OLE has been doing in the ports we've been supporting um since we've been doing the hail outs uh, we have about uh, 20 20 that we've done so far that uh, we've seen violating the speed restriction that we've held out to um and, and they've um slowed down for the most part uh but we've had 20 so far uh we, we've also did a uh a fishery enforcement um area commercial fishing vessel safety uh operation targeting uh, oyster vessels in the virginia area um, to coincide with their open harvest uh, areas um Ending at the end of January, uh, we, we did about 23 boardings and it resulted in uh, six uh, voyage uh, terminations uh, for safety issues. And then uh, we currently have one uh, going on for uh, the black sea bass um, off of uh, Virginia that's currently in wave one that we're that we're working now. On the, uh, the commercial fishing uh, vessel safety efforts, uh, we've done about 70 dockside exams uh, the past two months. We've issued 62 decals um, and we've had uh, Six terminations, like we said before, with the um, with the op that we're doing. Uh, some of the outreach efforts that our, uh, our examiners have been doing, um, they they're getting ready to attend the Ocean City uh, Maryland Expo. Um, should be a good event there. They're also at the Atlantic City uh, New Jersey Boat Show in March, and uh, they continue to conduct uh, outreach and commercial fishing vessel safety training. On the uh, the search and rescue cases and the casualties that we've had, um, we've had a grounding. Um, it was a uh, fishing vessel that ran aground, uh, was taken on water in Oregon Inlet there. We had three people on board. Um, the vessel, we were able to get them a pump, and uh, CETO was able to get them refloated, and uh, the vessel was towed to Wanchi for, uh, for haul out. And uh, during the, the post uh, search and rescue boarding, they had uh, seven deficiencies that we noted on that one. Uh, there's also a loss of propulsion. Um, one that we had, uh, the fishing vessel had an uh, engine uh, casualty in the Virginia area, it broke away from a mooring ball up in Craney Island. and. Uh, we were able to get the vessel safely uh, towed to uh, Portsmouth Marine Terminal, um, and the investigation is ongoing for that one. Um, and then uh, we had the, the six terminations from the, uh, the oyster vessel, uh, oyster uh, uh, commercial fishing vessel op that we ran. Um, and some of those uh, terminations were mostly due to insufficient life saving equipment. Um, the, uh, most of the vessels were operating in, in, in and around the Rappahannock and James River. And uh, some of the deficiencies uh, range from you know, no, no survival craft, emergency suits, uh, buoyant apparatus, inadequate firefighting, uh, things of that nature. 
And uh, that concludes uh, my portion of the briefing. I'll pending any questions. Any questions for Matt? Peter Hughes? Hey, man. I'm sorry. Did you say oyster vessels? We do. Uh, vessels that we're targeting oysters um, in the Virginia area. Uh, we, we normally like to focus our assets offshore. Uh, however, during the winter months, it gets a little challenging for us with the weather. Um, so that's a, some of those fleets that operate inshore uh, that we don't give a lot of attention to. Um, so every once in a while, we'll try to do an op just to see, uh, to check the safety vessel compliance on that. And you know, from time to time, we, we, you know, this one had, had some safety concerns that we were able to address, but uh, yeah, that, that's, what, that's what we did there. Any more questions? Uh, seeing none, thank you very much for the report. Caleb Gilbert, if I can come back to you for a minute. The question James Fletcher wanted to ask was, does the speed rules apply to military vessels and Coast Guard? All right, Matt, you got an answer to that? Yeah, so I can chime in on that one. Um, so there's an exemption. Yeah, there. sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Matt. Gosh. Yeah, sorry. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one on the Coast Guard side. So there's an exemption there uh, for for military vessels. I, I can only, I can't speak for the Navy, but I can speak for what Coast Guard how we we uh, we view it. Um, unless we're responding to a search and rescue case or a incident of national significance, national security, something like that, uh, we're following the speed rules. Um, our uh, we're conscious of the speed rule, and we want to make sure that um, we're doing our part on the whale side there. So. Yeah, we follow unless we have a search and rescue case or something that we absolutely need to, to, to violate it to get through the zone quicker. All right, thank you. And Caleb, do you have an answer for the uh, Navy vessels? Uh, no, I, I, I couldn't add anything more than um, what Matt just provided. I, I would have answered um, um, across all um, law enforcement that that would have been the, the case, that they would be required to follow um, the, the, the law unless there's a, unless under a specifically designated exemptions. And I, and I don't know those off the top of my head. All right, thank you. Skip Feller. I can tell you for a fact the Navy does not adhere to it. I have a picture of a frigate. We're sitting there watching a whale passing me inbound doing 23 knots. So the Navy's exempt and they they don't care. All right, thank you for that. Let's go on now to liaison reports, New England Council. Peter Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is my liaison report from uh, two weeks ago in uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, there were a lot of reports uh and presentations during this meeting uh, along with some action items um so the habitat committee report in their discussion regarding agriculture agriculture the council discussed their draft management alternatives for framework adjustment to facilitate offshore atlantic salmon aquaculture and they received um in regards to offshore energy the council received a progress report on foam and their Gulf of Maine offshore wind development activities. Stay tuned. Gulf of Maine is uh, get pretty lively here really soon. Uh, Monkfish committee report. I have no report as we addressed monkfish on Tuesday. The Scallop committee report. The council requested that nymphs request that nymphs establish a control date that could be used to determine eligibility criteria for switching between limited access general category permit categories in the Northern Gulf of Maine area. So control date for the Northern Gulf of Maine area. Uh, we discussed yesterday, uh, Mr. Reed did, uh, the ropeless fishing gear. Um, we received a presentation on that ropeless fishing gear um, in hopes of preventing gear conflicts. And then I believe Mr. Uh, Reed and Petney were discussing the uh, opportunity to stand up a working group to better understand those potential conflicts or interactions with other um, we received a presentation on addre addressing uncertainty in the council decision making and I for one really appreciated this presentation and sent an email to uh, 
Chris and others, Dr. Moore and others, um, that maybe this presentation, this council would benefit from similar presentation. So the presentation was given by Dr. Steve Cadron from the U U UMass Dartmouth School of uh, Marine Science and Technology on quantifying, interpreting, and communicating sources of uncertainty in the council's decision-making process. Um, I just say it was a really thoughtful and uh, insightful uh, presentation that that that, uh, that answers a lot of questions. Well, maybe maybe some um, un unanswered questions, but I thought it was a good presentation and recommended that this council receive it also. The ground fish committee, in regards to Atlantic halibut, the framework adjustment sixty nine. Or 65, the council moved to revise the halibut ABC years 2023-2025 to 160 metric tons and incorporate it into a framework. Council also moved to set the halibut state water subcomponent of 17.2 metric tons if the SSC recommends a halibut ABC of 160 metric tons. Um, Council recommends to GARFO the following rec recreational monitors for 2023 Gulf of Maine cod. Uh, I'm not going to go through the seasons, but uh, minimum size 22 inches, possession limit one fish, Gulf of Maine haddock, minimum size 18 inches, possession limit 15 fish per day. That was Gulf of Maine. Georgia's Bank cod, uh, minimum fish size of 23 inches and a possession limit of five fish per day. Um, there is a live link in there to the press release uh, for additional information and if you're curious about when those seasons are. We'd received some other presentations, uh, one on ecosystem-based fishery management, um, received a progress report on prototype MSE planning meetings for EBFM and the Georgia's Bank example fishery ecosystem plan and discussed EBFM public information workshops. So uh, more workshops, it sounds like, for EBFM. Um, I don't know if those... Ask Mr. Reed a question. Eric, those workshops, are they held in the Mid-Atlantic also? Are they coming all the way down the coast? Or is it just New England? I meant to ask that before. And don't know. As far as the, the ones that are upcoming, I, I, I am not sure. I don't think they've been set yet. But when we had a series of uh, public informational sessions, there was one scheduled in Manahawk in New Jersey. But for a variety of reasons, including lack of interest from the public, it was canceled. <laughs> Thank you. So they may, there may be EBFM workshops in the Middle Atlantic region or there may not be. <laughs> ICAT, we received the uh, update on ICAT, similar to the HMS update we received yesterday. Um, and we had a discussion about the National Marine, uh, the, the Hudson Canyon National Marine Sanctuary. The uh, 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 council approved the response to the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries request for information and input on draft regulations for fishing within the proposed Hudson Canyon National Marine Sanctuary. And it said a lot of a lot of reports actionable items uh, up in New England and that thank you. Any questions for Peter? Comments? Being none, thank you very much. The South Atlantic Council, do we I believe you guys didn't have a meeting? That's the last report. Yeah, that's correct. The next meeting is uh, March, uh, March 6th in Jekyll Island, Georgia. Uh, April. Oops. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to recognize also from the commission, Bob Beals here. Glad to see you. Do you have anything you'd like to report on from last week's meeting? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not a whole lot. Of the activities last week um, impacted uh, directly this council, but a couple things of interest probably are um, we talked about striped bass commercial transfers for ocean uh, state by state uh, shares, and that was postponed um, 
asking the technical committee to go back and do some more analysis on the potential impact on fishing mortality associated with moving quota between states along the East Coast. Um, we got a report out on the American eel population, which is unfortunately in pretty rough shape. And we're going to, um, there's some additional work being done by the technical committee there as well to try to look into to options for moving forward on American eel. We've been working hard to restore that fishery for a long time and not many, not very much positive news there. So um, a lot of it has to do with habitat, water quality, and other issues rather than fisheries harvest. The fisheries harvest is way down. Um, but so we'll keep working on that and have a report out. And then related to all the lobster conversations we had here earlier, um, the, there's a public hearing document on improving the resiliency of the American lobster um, population in the Gulf of Maine. Just the concern is, um, you know, as water's warm all the way up through the Gulf of Maine, we need to be poised to react if we start seeing a decline in that population and, and put in some automatic triggers with associated management measures, measures uh, that will automatically go in place. So those are a few of the highlights from last week. Um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Bob. Any questions? Peter Hughes. I do not have a question for Bob, but I did neglect part of my report. And it's just to say, E A G L E S, Eagles. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'm shooting for the squares. I don't care who wins the game, just give me those squares. A couple of those hundred dollar squares said it would be very nice. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that concludes our organizational reports. Uh, let's go to other business and general public comment. Is there any other business to bring before the council? All right, we have Jim Fletcher. Let's go ahead and try and see if we can hear you this time. Go ahead, James. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, so you can speak up just a little bit. Okay, what I am asking the council is to implement electronic reporting in the EEZ. The United National Fishermen's Association has asked for this from probably somewhere starting in 1994. NOAA, National Marine Fisheries, has found a way to evade the 2006 Mangasin Act that required registration of recreational fishing. The United National Fishermen's Association is asking that this council implement electronic reporting using Bluefin data app that is already to implement. They will keep the data or the council can have the data. But what you have discussed today, the lawsuits of over shares and stuff like that, we have no way to know how many recreational fishermen are getting the shares that is being implemented. So this is a request to please implement electronic reporting. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, James. It's, we have it on record and they will take it into consideration. Any more comments or questions? Chris, I believe we were done. Thank you very much, everyone, for the meeting this week. Thank you to the council staff. You guys did a great job, as always. And see everybody in two months in North Carolina. Thank you.